Hello, everyone, and good morning, and welcome to the first of our series, Day in the Life series. My name is Paige Callahan, and I am very excited to be here today with Josh Patoko for our first guest on the Day in the Life series here at Berkeley's COEH, Continuing Education. So, Josh, thank you so much for being here, and how are you this morning? Hi, Paige. Hi, everybody. I'm doing great. It's kind of a relaxed, casual Friday, which is a, a good way to end a busy couple of weeks around here. So. I'm doing good. Yeah, that's awesome. And so where are you coming from right now? I know we're, uh, I'm in I'm, Berkeley, but where are you speaking at right now? We're at Berkeley. I'm on the East Coast, physically in Falls Church, Virginia, in a sort of nondescript gray building full of cubicles, affectionately known as the Death Star. And uh, there's a bunch of senior uh, military medical folks who do policy work here. Um, and so it's, um, I stole someone's office near my, my little cubicle in the corner. Awesome. Okay. Well, we're glad to have you here, um, here in this interview from the Death Star. <laughs> so Josh, a little bit about yourself. So you are originally an aerospace engineer to then a flight officer, a Marine helicopter flight surgeon to an MPH graduate, and now an occupational medicine professional with a neuroscience background. Now I yeah. could say that you were one of the most interesting people I've ever had the privilege of chatting to. I feel like other our listeners and viewers will say the same. So I'm curious if you could tell me a bit about how you got into occupational medicine. The short version is I wanted to be an ER doc. And I uh, ended up, my wife and I wanted to make sure we could stay together in our training. So instead of me going straight, straight through for emergency medicine, I somehow landed orders to Hawaii to be a flight doc for the Marine Corps for uh, Marine pilots who fly Hueys and Cobras attack helicopters. And um, so I landed these great orders and she landed a great spot in psychiatry at the University of Hawaii. And then while I was in that job for four years, I had some revelations about what I really wanted to do. And one thing led to another and I started talking to folks who are more in the occupational medicine and the aerospace medicine side of the house. So basically full-time flight surgeon for uh, military pilots or civilian uh, pilots. And I realized that, oh, I can do aviation. I could do aerospace medicine. I, that would be a lot of fun. I could just do that instead of ER. But what if I did this OC thing? Because if I do the OC thing, I could do occupational and environmental medicine training and practice and then I can also do aerospace on top of it. So it kind of came to me in this weird way of wanting to do something else entirely, having this experience, taking care of uh, a working population that I got to sit down in clinic and have conversations with them and help them through difficult injuries and exposures, difficult experiences and building relationships with them. And rarely, honestly, having to work uh, a holiday weekend or an, or an overnight or take call unless the whole unit was getting up and going together to to deploy which i was happy to do so um so it's a combination of things but it really was that four years with the marines and having continuity and ability to see see patients and and take care of workers from a wide variety of workplace exposures who i could have a relationship with some of with some of whom I took care of for four years the whole time I was there they were also there the whole time we also had a lot of turnover but yeah it kind of it kind of just snuck up on me and that's a lot of my colleagues started out wanting to do something else uh, most of us don't know a lot about occupational and environmental medicine residency and practice during medical school it's not something mm -hmm. you get a lot of exposure to during medical school so you hear this story a lot oh I went and did something else and I found my calling in Ahmed. Right. Well, we and we are so glad that you did. Um, throughout that, because I knew you had a very successful career in that as well. Very so I'm yeah. curious then if you could speak to a bit about how your experience, specifically in the Navy, helped you get to occupational medicine. Like you said, a lot of people find it; they don't really know about it. But do you find that you still would have kind of found that niche if you weren't in the Navy, or how did that kind of inspire I'm you? I'm not sure, honestly. Uh, at the military. Uh, is unique. We um, we ask a lot of folks in the military, mm -hmm. especially when we deploy them. Um, you could see this play out in the news, whether it's traumatic brain injuries from things that 
blow up and cause traumatic brain injuries or chemical exposures due to being in risky environments or airborne exposures like burn pits is in the news. Um, so we have a lot of opportunity in our military population for bad things to happen. Um, in the aviation world, um, I came from being in the Navy in a prior life as uh, someone who flew airplanes. So I had been an aerospace engineer because I liked flying and I flew airplanes on aircraft carriers, then switched to medicine. Mm -hmm. So I knew how risky that kind of work was being on an aircraft carrier, the things that can go wrong, um, just living on a ship, what that's like. So the military is chock full of exposures, even things like heat, uh, heat injury for Marine recruits. It's 90 something degrees in Virginia today and probably 80% humidity. And we have Marines down in Quantico hiking with 50 pound packs and rifles with helmets on and full gear. Uh, and we're, uh, we occasionally, we have a heat injury, right? So we, we take, uh, the military takes a lot of risks. So there's a lot of opportunity for prevention, for treatment and uh, uh, trying to mitigate the risk that we know the military is gonna face so that these folks can meet the mission, which is of course to uh, protect us all and keep us safe. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. And you know, you answered one of my one of my next questions, which was the importance of occupational medicine in the military, because I think that's something that a lot of people don't think about is that there's so many, as you mentioned, exposures that need to be addressed that I don't think um, like the person would think about every day. So if you could, I know you shared a few, but are there any other really common occupational illnesses and injuries that you see amongst service members? Oh, and yeah. how would you say that these are different. I mean, some that you mentioned were very different, like explosives, but um, how much does that differ from the general public? And do you ever work with the general public? So I do, we do see a lot of uh, military civil, uh, so Department of the Defense, Department of Defense employed civilians. So fire, a lot of firefighters, a lot of cops, a lot of child care workers, um, child youth programs, a lot of health care workers. So we do the, you know, it's just like a large health system. We're a huge health system. So we have a ton of healthcare workers and our healthcare workers are spread out to some pretty far flung places. I mean, Djibouti just uh, near Somalia and um, Peru and Singapore. I mean, basically you name an area of the world where there's a ton of uh, potential unusual infectious disease risks, our healthcare workers are there. So that's one uh, that's a common thread. Of, of occupational exposures, any kind of infectious disease exposure, mm -hmm. um, and not just to healthcare workers, but to the operational units. And then you have things like firing ranges where, yes, uh, domestically police officers and security officers do go to the firing range, but our folks go to the firing ranges a lot more with a lot more powerful weapons. And so the hearing protection, hearing conservation is huge in the military, mm -hmm. it's a huge problem still. Um, it's one of those things that requires constant vigilance. It only takes one time, one shot, one time close enough to the head, you know, going down range without the proper hearing protection on that you could have a permanent injury. So that constant vigilance, sometimes 20, 30 year career for Marines who do this routine, routinely many times per year, right? Not to mention the instructors on the range who are exposed to all the lead and the dust in the air. Mm -hmm. So we, we have a very careful uh, blood lead monitoring program for our range workers. Um, what else? Ships are uh, constantly corroding, so they have to come into the yard and be repaired. Uh, that involves a lot of blasting. So we're usually blasting with material that a uh, very complex set of PPE is required to protect mm -hmm. those folks. And every now and then they get exposed. Welding, uh, older ships, sometimes removing and replacing asbestos. I mean, they're when you kind of pull out the manual for occupational toxicology and you just start going down the list, it's kind of like, yep, we have that. We have that. We pretty much have everything <laughs> in the book of occupational toxicology. So, um, you know, it just depends whether the environment is more um, for deployed in an operational setting where maybe you're worried about the dust storms and burn pits and scorpion envenomations and, <laughs> you know, um, infectious disease uh, spreading through a, a forward operating area, or you're all the way back down in Norfolk, Virginia, with thousands of shipyard workers who are on all these different uh, 
respiratory and chemical medical surveillance programs, and you're trying to keep them from ever having an exposure to beryllium, you know, you're mm -hmm. trying to prevent that from ever happening. And if something does pop up on one of their exams or an exposure does occur, you're there ready to treat and take the next step. So yeah, we, we <laughs> the landscape is broad, especially in the Navy with our, our ships, and then not to mention submarines. Every submarine in the Navy uh, right now has uh, nuclear power. So we have a radiation health program. Yeah, very important. Same with our healthcare workers, of course, exposed to, you know, CAT, CAT scans and fluoroscopy. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, submarines are, chock I mean, they're, it's like a space station, but underwater. It's completely self-contained. They can go underwater for a long time. And wow. so they need to be able to handle their own toxic exposures and they do not have physicians on board. They have corpsmen. So uh, we have to train non-medical people to do to be good at things like IH type activities and mm -hmm. a little bit of medical type activity. They have to kind of know uh, what to look for in the medical side. So right. you can go on and on and on, but that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the, some of the big ones that come to my mind. No, that was, that was so helpful. I mean, I'm in environmental occupational health sciences and those half the things I didn't think about that you just listed. So it definitely, this is what this whole series is about is bringing that new awareness and it's very interesting, again, to get a perspective uh, from a service member, which we don't often get. So thank you again. So I know now that you mentioned the Death Star, you're in a policy position with Navy Medicine Headquarters. Um, could you tell me a bit about how you draw on your own experiences to influence the policy decisions now? Sure. So um, policy flows down, you know, the military is run by civilians, right? So in this country, thankfully. So policy flows down often from the commander in chief, the president of the United States and their uh, assignees, their appointees, um, secretary of defense, et cetera. But it also really flows from Congress. Congress will write laws saying, hey, Dr. Pataco, you will in your clinic, you will test every firefighter every year for PFAS in their blood the PFAS chemical, which many people are familiar with, the forever mm -hmm. chemical, the Teflon toxin. Okay. So that is a direct example of uh, advocates going to Congress saying, we're worried about this chemical. Firefighters use a special chemical in the in aviation firefighting because there's so much gasoline and oil on airfields. You have to be able to put that fire out and you can't use water. So the Navy decades ago de designed this foam a foam layer that they can spray on top of an oil fire to deprive the oil from the oxygen that it needs to burn. So you can temporarily put down an oil fire with this something called AFFF, aqueous film forming foam. Mouthful, right? A little <laughs> mouthful. So we've been using this stuff for decades and sure enough, it's got PFAS in it and we're moving away from that. But in the meantime, we kind of need to worry about these firefighters who mm -hmm. have used this stuff in training, used it on real fires. and you know, the people who stock it and remove it and clean it up and all those things. And so Congress said, hey, you will do it. And oh, by the way, you'll do all these other things to monitor them. And the implementation of the general broad ask, the broad statement, you will do this test. There's a lot of nuance and detail that comes out of that that requires mm -hmm. expertise. So I think back to my training and I go, wow, that's crazy. I, I spent an entire month looking at PFAS with NRDC in San Francisco. That was my project, was look at PFAS and how do physicians communicate to patients about PFAS? Not anything to do with firefighters. This was about PFAS in water systems throughout the country that has just trickled into the water systems and now we're drinking it at our tap and it's building up in our tissues because it's a persistent organic pollutant, a POP for the EPA, right? And um, it's persistent because it just, you know, there aren't too many enzymes or even UV light or anything that will break it down. It just it has a half-life of hundreds of years or decades. So I was looking at it for a different reason back in um, training. And now here I am several years later. And I remember watching the hearings when they were happening. And I saw the bench science and sort of the work that NRDC was doing about drinking water. Saw the hearings occur. Now I'm seeing the orders from Congress flow out in law and be processed through different chains of command and hit my office as specific questions and specific asks of, hey, how, would, how do you recommend we do this type of communication, this type of testing? What should our survey look like? And I can say, you know, there's a direct 
connection between my training and the answer that I give, right? And mm -hmm. um, so that's a very concrete, recent, specific example. Um, there's also, uh, there's also a policy in general is complex because you have, sometimes you have people who are not scientists who have to weigh in on things. So mm -hmm. public affairs and legal. So you may have an interested party, maybe it's a very high ranking person, maybe it's a Congress person who's worried about one of their constituents or all of the military or whatever. They may ask a policy question, hey, what's our policy on X, Y, or Z? What's our policy on burn pits? What's going on with burn pits? And some of the work of responding to that or responding to the public, my scientific doctor brain science work also has to be vetted by public affairs and legal or vice versa, they will come up with things and I will vet them. Uh, mm -hmm. We, my team, our, our, us, the, a bunch of us, will vet what lawyers are saying to each other in official communication. So yeah, policy in the military, and then kind of what I'm doing is different than like at the state level where a public health officer uh, might be the county public health officer and COVID is hitting and they're trying to figure out what do we tell our county about COVID and the public health officer kind of is the senior person making the decision, but they're relying on their team. Policy is a little different everywhere you go, but where I am, they're asking for my occupational medicine, environmental medicine, toxicology expertise to include the bench science, interpreting the recent studies, but also, hey doc, you sat down with patients, you know what it looks like to talk to a patient, what their concerns are, um, you know, what uh, public Public health risk communication tools should look like what they should feel like um, and that's where i'm able to that's the voice they need me to speak up on most often mm -hmm. awesome thank you yeah. i think with so many and um situations like you said policy is so complex and it gets so confusing where the nuances in each situation so thank you for shedding some light into what you do sure. with even though yours is very specific Specific and very different than maybe what you said a public health officer would do. What would you say? I'm kind of throwing a curveball question at you, sure. but what would you say are two skills that you um, would recommend to people who are interested in, in advising on policy in any regard, or two skills you think are important to emphasize in order to be effective in your recommendations for policy? So, a lot of the policy work since I've been here, some of it's due to COVID, some of it is the way it's always been, is a phone call with 40 to 50 people on it the vast majority of which you've never met in person. They're of all different hierarchical ranks. <laughs> um, this is my rank right down here, Commander 05. So I'm an Officer 5, which, um, you know, sometimes I'm briefing and there are admirals on the line. So 07, 08, 09. So it goes up and down. There are civilians, many of whom, you know, I just look at every civilian and say, they all outrank me because they're civilians. Um, and so there's a matter of, there's a matter of sort of tact and nuance of communication, whether it's a large group of 30 people sitting in a room looking at each other, or even more important, a phone call of 40 people on it, sort of knowing where and when is your time to speak up and interject, because you're probably the one who has the answer with the best reference to answer or the answer that mm -hmm. is, has the best credential behind it, like the Ahmed training, the Ahmed experience of being in clinic. And so there uh, are a wide variety of personality styles and approaches on in meetings, but essentially learning how to navigate a meeting is a skill, whether it's three people or whether it's 300 people. I, thankfully, I'm not on too many calls with 300 people, <laughs> but I am often on calls with 30 to 50 people and it's it can right. be tough. I've mm -hmm. also run calls, I've, that's the other thing, okay. First, you got to learn how to attend these things and, and find out when and where to speak up and how to use, how do you get your point across concisely and with impact? Um, what, I, what you learn, what I do better now than I did when I first showed up, the skill I have worked on, I hope, is to speak a little bit more, uh, late, a little bit later in the conversation <laughs> after many of other, many other people have had their turn so I, I hear a little bit more of the inputs 
and I'm building in my head, oh, wait, this is sounding like something I need to weigh in on. And then formulating and crafting the statement that is not a six minute diatribe, but is a 37 second, one or two concepts, and then a pause, and then see if there's a follow up, and then take the follow up. Uh, that's a skill that I, I, they do formally teach at Berkeley in, in some uh, communications classes, which I never took. <laughs> so I'm learning it here as I go. Um, and then also managing teams. So not just leading a meeting like that, which is very mm -hmm. challenging, which I have done and staying on time and on topic and making people feel valued. But sometimes you just have to cut people off. You just have to say, hey, sorry, I'm really sorry, but I think you just covered five different things. Can we go back to number one? And they usually appreciate that. The group usually appreciates that because I'm not the only one. Especially mm -hmm. when I'm not the only one who's like, wait, we just covered three, four, five. That's five different things. Wait, let's go back to one. Um, navigating the nuance of care and respect for people when you're mm -hmm. leading a meeting and not just cutting them off. Like, let's just get to the next thing. I mean, I've seen it go that way. It doesn't usually go over as well. It's not as productive, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So there's that meetings in general, but also leading teams, peer leadership, someone who you're on equal footing with who you feel, oh, maybe I need to just persuade this person that this is uh, creating a formal memo with a, a signature by this person and routing it this way sounds really boring, but this is how we make the big impact, not an email tomorrow. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's verbals, there's emails, there's formal memos, there's signatures that go all the way up to the president of the United States. I mean, uh, figuring out how to peer lead when multiple stakeholders all have good points, but you're you're you kind of saying to yourself, I think I see the way forward that's going to work out best for all of us. And then leadership is about persuasion, right? So it's about tactfully leading others to your point of view. And if that's not the way the team decides to go, the, the leader of the team um, supporting their decision, that's something we do in the military is kind of don't hold a grudge and don't, you know, be offended if your opinion is not the one taken every time, 100%, kind of realizing that, that the multiple stakeholder approach in our world is by design and it, it usually works out fit for the best. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's, hopefully that's, uh, I mean, it doesn't really sound like medicine, does it? But when you're in policy, that applies to anyone in policy, all the things. Yeah. Like yeah. So. No, that was so helpful. I think I'm going to go sign up for one of these communication courses at Berkeley and Hopefully they'll bring you as a guest speaker. <laughs> well, no, they're very good. And um, I didn't, it was just a matter of schedule that I wasn't able to take one that some of my colleagues did. So I, I kind of glommed onto what they were learning and asked them uh, about some of the learning points. And I'm glad um, there were numerous other opportunities for me during training and now to, to practice it. And practice is the you know best way to learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Especially for skills like that, that you are yeah. so important, but so those need to be harnessed quite well. So that's yeah. awesome. What um, I do? I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm curious if you could just tell me a little bit about uh, in occupational medicine and in your policy role. Um, I know you're talking about advising policy for better health care, um, but within that, how or have you had any experience with policy recommendations to help make occupational medicine for service members in particular um, more inclusive, more equitable, or more accessible? Yeah, so, man, several things come to light. Um, so when we talk about access, the good news is in occupational medicine, um, it's a statutory requirement. So we're providing the service almost like human resources or almost like as an employee benefit. In other words, the employer is saying, I wanna protect my workers. Not only do I want to, I have to, OSHA tells me how. <laughs> so I have to provide this as a legal right, a legal good, right? Or else things could go very bad. Employees could get sick or hurt. Uh, morale could go down. The employees might not feel great about coming into work if they don't think they're being protected, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. But also I'm gonna follow the law. And yes, there are financial implications if you don't protect someone, right? So we're mm -hmm. different than healthcare delivery, primary care, where unfortunately uh, we have learned through a lot of study of healthcare systems 
that there is implicit bias throughout the system and people get treated differently. Our practice is a little bit more algorithmic in that, in that when someone walks in, the focus is on their job title, their job work site, and their um, exposures at work in the job. And that drives sort of the medical decision-making more than almost anything else. We've removed, um, so gosh, I could go on all day about this, right? There's a ton of vulnerable populations in the healthcare delivery yeah. system. When we think about vulnerable patients in our system, we think about people who lack agency and lack um, maybe uh, the ability to, to communicate with their supervisor in an honest way. In other words, they're worried about getting trouble at work. They're worried about being pulled off the job. They're worried about losing their job. That's a vulnerable population for us. It has almost nothing to do with demographic or anything else. It mm -hmm. has to do with what is your job? So if you're a uh, laborer, so that is a job title, laborer, uh, where you lift heavy boxes and stock shelves and drive forklifts, often you have less agency than a manager or supervisor, somebody who's running the whole warehouse, right? Who's running a schedule for a hundred people, drivers and laborers and mechanics and plumbers. So where you kind of fall, what your job tasks are and sort of what your supervisory relationship looks like, that's a concern for us in terms of vulnerability for the patient. So we keep that, we talk about it. We keep it at the front of our mind and, um, Thankfully, the sort of HR legal side of the house, it's by design, we're looking out for the people mm -hmm. who are most likely to be injured or sick. We're trying to prevent the high probability, high injury, severity injuries. And often they are the people with the least agency. So it kind of it kind of works out for the most part. There are other times where it doesn't work out great, where, um, uh, let's see, we have hard charging Marines who um, maybe it's cultural. They, there's a culture of going to see a physician of any kind or a provider of any kind is seen as a weakness, right? And that's a huge problem in mental health in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, Ock and environmental, environmental medicine doesn't play in the military that I've seen, doesn't play a huge role in mental health, but we do play a role. So we always are on the lookout for uh, folks who uh, culturally they're vulnerable because they're kind of, the implication is you shouldn't be going to the doctor. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, that exists outside the military too. It really does. Yeah. There, are, there are trades and businesses. I mean, uh, the, the fishing trade, the construction industry, there's a bunch of industries where the perception is if you go to medical, if you complain about an injury or, or a pain, uh, it's perceived weakness or perceived trying to get out of something or perceived secondary gain where uh, we face that too um, for our civilians and our military. So yeah, it's a little different. It's, it's a great question um, because we probably could always use a little bit more formal education and reviving of this topic and doing a pulse check on how are we doing on this? Do we have any studies telling us how we're doing on this? Do we just think we're doing mm -hmm. a good job or we studied it? You know, that's to, to my uh, top of my head. I don't know that there are a lot of good recent studies about um, concern for um, equity in the clinic, right. right clinic. Uh, other than the ones we, the things I already mentioned, you know, uh, mm -hmm. people who are culturally taught not to go to medical and people who don't have agency if, if they're in their workplace. Beyond that, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. That is a that's a great answer though. I think in so many ways, so many different industries can always do better with with that. But the fact that in the way it sounds more comprehensive by looking at who has less agency and and who's at the highest risk is something that in a lot of healthcare systems they don't even look at that. They don't look at the root of these exposures. So I think that's that's a great step there. So thank you for sharing that. Sure. On the topic though of mental health and work-life balance, though, getting out of your job, how do you yep. keep a work-life balance and what do you do outside of work? Well, um, when I was in Hawaii, <laughs> what my, what I considered to be fun was going out and getting dirty in the land. We had a little property there and uh, a couple acres and it was weed covered 
Hawaiian clay soil that needed a lot of love. So we tried to hobby farm it. <laughs> so it was spending time outside. You know, it's kind of like the opposite of a policy job being in a cubicle on a, on a laptop. It's being right. exposed to all of the elements and all of the farm animals and all the dust kicking up. It's like kind of being the, the worker for a change um, and, and lifting heavy objects, feed bags and stuff. So what my wife and I did some small scale uh, egg operations and, you know, chicken and duck eggs, literally 40, <laughs> 40 chickens, 30 ducks, um, some pet pigs, a bunch of dogs. I mean, we just kind of spent a lot of time outdoors. Uh -huh. Enjoying the, enjoying our, the Hawaiian lifestyle that is the sort of outdoorsy backwoods farm lifestyle of Hawaii and, and going to the beach, of course. Now that we're on the East Coast, it's different. You know, it's, um, we live in a townhouse where we chose that by design so that to recover from busy work weeks, my wife mm -hmm. working as a psychiatrist, um, we can walk to things, you know, we can walk Old Town Alexandria, which is several hundred years old and has all kinds of historical significance and lots of little tucked away little places that we can visit. But it's kind of the opposite of being out in the middle of nowhere in Hawaii, right? It's, like <laughs> old, it's an old East Coast city that's, you know, like I said, muggy and hot and mosquito-y today, but, um, and then in the winter freezes over, right? So it, yep. <laughs> we get out, we get out a lot. We have bulldogs. We have English Bulldogs, and uh, and then I play a little guitar for fun. I did read that you have a band, so. <laughs> I had a band. They're kind of scattered. Yeah, I, I, I'm always trying to get the band back together. That's a perpetual. Yeah. I was after retirement. Say, after I retire. Yes, you have your upcoming retirement. Well, congratulations on that again. After a very successful career, and then I look forward to the to the tour, the reunion tour of your band. It might be short, but yeah. <laughs> um, so I have one last question for you, and that is given your vast experience and your incredible career in the Navy as a doctor and in all the other work you do in occupational medicine, what would be one piece of advice you could give to someone who either wants to go into occupational environmental medicine or someone who's doing something completely different, but maybe is thinking about it now? All right, so for someone who is just starting to scratch the surface to think about it, um, and, and when you say OCK and environmental medicine, I mean, I feel like the thing that's left out of this is what's, what's great about it is working with um, physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, PAs, corpsmen. So for the, us, that's medics, highly trained medics, mm -hmm. um, uh, nurses, who are many of whom specially trained in occupational medicine, uh, even the front desk workers. I mean, we just were very uh, tight knit bunch uh, and we rely on each other very heavily. I rely very heavily on the front desk to help me navigate some of the administrative challenges of getting a record from point A to point B so that it, it satisfies all of the statutory requirements. You know what I mean? I mean. I, I'm the one who went to med school, but man, they're the one who's been at the front desk for 20 years and they know how to get stuff done. They know how to get supervisors on the phone, right? So, so you have a team concept within a clinic, but then immediately you step out of the clinic, you're talking to industrial hygiene, you're physically going with them to places. So these are all options for people to do. Options mm -hmm. are spend time in a clinic or spend time in a dirty workplace. Find a dirty workplace with people who are going to investigate it and check it out. I mean, uh, one good thing about UCSF's and Berkeley's program is the ability to go see a bunch of places like a quarry, a cement factory, the sugar mill up in um, Richmond, um, mm -hmm. wine, you know, uh, wine growing operations, other kind of agricultural operations where they process, you know, just a million different places where you could see, oh my, like, it's almost like a combination of like dirty jobs that show. I, don't know if that's I remember that show. Micro. Yeah, that's going back yeah. a few years. <laughs> that's the extreme. But you know what? You know, there's far more people doing a lot of these dirty jobs than you could ever appreciate, you know? Yeah. And so getting out and seeing workers in their natural environment, construction, I mean, construction seems to be everywhere these days. Um, uh, fishing, farming, forestry. Uh, I mean, there's just a, if there's an industry that interests someone, 
we toured Pixar and saw how the animators have all these special ergonomic setups because their animation days, some of their days get really long as the movie gets closer to being finished. And they have all these elaborate contraptions to keep them from getting overuse injuries to their tendons. I mean, something you would never think about. I mean, I would had not really thought about until we went and actually saw each office at Pixar and all the different contraptions they had, uh, standing workstations with treadmills because they didn't want to yeah. stand in one place, right? So, um, so for anyone interested in it, step one is maybe learn a little bit more about either the ox side, which is what I've been talking about, or the environmental side, uh, which could be air quality. So maybe it's attending an air quality board meeting. Maybe it's um, volunteering. I mean, gosh, in Hawaii, we have these huge beach cleanups where they do uh, microplastic filtering. Mm -hmm. Crazy. They'll go out with 100 people. Everybody's got a filter and you'll sift the sand, take all the microplastics out of the sand and then put it together and take it to a processing facility. Just learning what's in the water, what's in the air, what's in the soil mm -hmm. in a volunteer capacity or in a, you know, in a work capacity or uh, as part of recreation even. Um, there's a million ways to suddenly realize, oh, I'm surrounded by uh, and environmental <laughs> issues all the time in my daily life, whether I like it or not. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, so it could be an interest in the fashion industry and how uh, this has been in the news recently and how synthetics in the fashion industry are affecting the oceans or whatever. I mean, it, there, what's crazy, you talk to people like me, you talk to another person like me, and they're going to have a totally different trajectory and background. A lot of uh, environmental medicine docs, no two are alike almost mm -hmm. is what it seems like. I mean, we have folks who uh, work for Kaiser and crank, you know, or any other big health system and crank through clinical encounters of people who are acutely injured each day at work. And we have people who do trial depositions for cancer trials where a worker might have been exposed to something that might have caused their cancer. And now they're trying to uh, get financial accountability from the company for that. And the doc is testifying and reviewing hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents, right? Those two things are as completely different as can be. And they both yeah. might have gone to the same training program a couple of years before, which is crazy. Right. Um, and so because it's every environment and every job, it's kind of everywhere. Um, and that gives people an opportunity to think about it. Well, maybe this is a, a career for me of, of trying to protect people from these issues. I mean, maybe, um, yeah, there's so many uh, great resources, mentorship resources through places like COEH and opportunities for education. So um, I feel like people can really learn more about it in a wide variety of ways. Definitely. I liked what you said, every environment and every job. I think that just speaks to the yeah. scope of, of the work and exactly in, in every job. So thank you so much, Josh. We're out of time for any more questions, but for taking the time to speak with me and sharing your insights and perspective. Um, I'm sure our listeners and our viewers are going to really appreciate all that you had to say, and maybe we'll find a new career path into the world of occupational medicine and all that that has to offer. We, well, I should say the last thing, we definitely need people. There is a shortage of just about every one of those jobs that I mentioned, um, both in and outside the military and COVID has made that worse. So uh, COVID has highlighted the need for prevention you know, of help of the, the protection of workers' health in a very specific way. And that has opened the, uh, focused the lens on our specialty. So mm -hmm. that means there's even more desire for, for folks who are trained in this than ever. So mm -hmm. the, the, it's an opportunity. So. Exactly. It's an opportunity. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, come back next week. We'll have more exciting interviews with people in the occupational environmental health field, where you can learn a lot more about every environment, every job, and where you can have an impact.